Good morning, Kahal Kadosh, Shavua Tov Umevorach. Beruchim Abayim to everybody. Today, Tuesday, the 27th day of Shevat, corresponding to the 9th of February. Today's class, graciously sponsored by our dear member, Mr. Roger Baghdadi and family. Le'ilu Nishmat, his beloved wife, Rachel Bad Lora Alea Hashalom. Iratzon to the zechut of the words of Torah that we're going to learn together for the next few minutes will be an aliyat neshama to Rachel Bat Lora Alea Hashalom. So today we'll attempt Be'ezat Hashem to understand the beautiful Zohar that discusses in the beginning of this week's perasha the following concept. If you remember on Sunday we learn the portion of Sunday of the Zohar, and one of the statements the Zohar says is, you are not allowed to call another person, with, especially another Jew, with a derogatory name. And the reason the Zohar Kadosh says is because every Yehudi has a spark of heaven, so to speak, its essence of godliness in the life, in the name of the Neshama Elokit, the godly spiritual element, that is one of the differences between the Jewish people and the rest of the world. And therefore, something that carries a certain level of holiness, you cannot denigrate or belittle by calling it with a derogatory name. Interesting enough, and I have the book behind me, uh, The Kafa Haim by Rabbi Haim Palachi, uh, right in the first or second chapter, uh, says that every aspect of life contains a level of holiness and godliness. Otherwise, it cannot exist. Meaning to say something that exists in the world, it has, it needs to have the battery, which is the godly essence that makes it function and includes garments and foods. So if garments and foods, the Kafa Haim already writes, be careful because it has a godly element that makes it happen and exist. For sure, when it comes to a human being, how careful we need to be in that matter. I'm saying this statement as the springboard for the Zohar from yesterday that we did not learn. The Zohar begins and it says, in last week's Torah portion, we received the Ten Commandments. Five of them in the one, in one tablet, the second one in the second tablet. Today, you use the word tablet, you think it's a digital board. But obviously, the ma'ase, the luchot, were ma'ase elokim hemma. They were godly. The tablets that Moshe Rabbeinu gave to Am Israel, the Ten Commandments, were godly in many ways. But it says the Zohar Kadosh, if you look in Perasha Mishpatim, without a break between Perashat Itro, which was the Perasha of the Ten Commandments, and Perasha Mishpatim, we have Mizvot in between. Some Mizvot discuss in the, at the end of Perashat Itro, and 53, I believe, if I have the number correct, Yes, 53 commandments are given in Perasha Mishpatim. 23 positive commandments and 30 negative commandments. So this is what Akadosh says. Why? Give me a break. I just got the 10 commandments. Let me digest them. Why? You have automatically, as soon as one Perasha is over, right away, the other Perasha begins with a lot of misvot. But perhaps I will answer with a pasuk from last week's Torah portion, and that will help us understand what the Zohar of today is trying to say. I will bring a homash from here, and open the end of Perashat Itro to understand how careful the Torah is, not only with the words, 
but actually with the eternal messages. At the end of Perashat Itro, the Torah brings me a commandment about the building of a Mizbeach, an altar. And at the end of the Perasha, the Pasuk says, Belo ta'ale bema'alot al mizbehi. This is the last Pasuk of last week's Torah portion. Do not climb up on steps when to go up on the Mizbeach, meaning to say that the Mizbeach, let me take my recorder, this is the Mizbeach, okay? This is how the ramp was. Okay, a lot of gadgets. This is the ramp, and this was actually the Mizbeach. Square, with corners, etc. But the going up from the ground, from the floor, to the Mizbeach, it was on a ramp. Why not steps? So the Pasuk says, do not make steps when you go up to the Mizbeach. So your nakedness will not be revealed. Now, he, who will be the person that will walk to the Mizbeach to bring the offering? Short answer, the Kohanim. And the Kohanim were dressed, the regular Kohanim, will wear four white garments. The Kohen Gadol will wear four white plus four colorfuls. Comes Rashi and it says, why? It wouldn't be more practical to have steps instead of a ramp. Doesn't need to be ADA accessible, handicap accessible. It's for a Kohen. The Kohen needed to have certain physical faculties to be able to work in the Beit HaMikdash. If God forbid there were certain physical blemishes to the Kohen, he was given different type of jobs in the Beit HaMikdash, but not some related to the carrying of the animals and the korbanot, etc. So comes Rashi and it says, no. When there are steps, you must widen your steps. Meaning to say, you must open your legs. Even though that nobody sees the nakedness of the Kohen. As the Pasuk tells us that the Kohen needed to have special pens that the Kohen wore. Nevertheless, says the Rashi, Arhabata Pesiot. The stepping, it's the opening of the legs. It's an insinuation that the erva, the nakedness of men, is there. I'm by you widening your legs. And that's why, according to the halacha, I'm throwing this. The halacha writes that a person, especially a man, should not cross the legs at the synagogue. Sometimes people take one leg and they put the, the ankle of one leg on top of the knee of the other. And then they put the sidur or the homash on top of the bended leg. According to the Lacha, there is a problem. First of all, the person is sitting in a way which is not respectful to be in the synagogue. From ladies department, there is the issue of seniut, which is obvious. So comes Rashi and it says, that the mere fact that a person, by making these motions of climbing the legs and the opening of between the legs, it could be an embarrassment to the stone. That's what Ashri says. Beata noheg bahem minghad bizayon. Are you not treating them with respect? Behalo de varin kalvahomer. More so, Rashi says. Uma habanim halalu. If the stones she'en bahem da'at that don't have the brain lehakpid ala bizayon to feel sensitive on their being disrespected imagine yourself you go to your bedroom and you tell the night table I don't like you or you go to your wardrobe 
and you say to your sweater or suit or shirt or tie or jacket or skirt, I don't like you. I'm not taking you out today. Can you imagine saying this to a garment? And that's what Rashi says. Look at the sensitivity of the Torah, that the mere insinuation that a person may offend the stone that has no brain, that has no sechel. Amra ha-Torah, the Torah says, Ho'il be'yesh bahem sorech, since there is a need for them, meaning to say they are instrumental in helping or achieve our goal. Lo tinhag bahem minhag bizayon. Do not mistreat them. Do not act in a way that is offensive. And comes a beautiful Rashi and it says, Havercha, your friend, Shehubitmut Yosrecha, that is in the image and in the form of the Almighty, as we re- learn back in Bereshit, Umakpid al Bizyono, if he's belittled or mistreated, the person feels the pain because you're dealing with emotions. Alahat kama be kama. How much careful a person needs to be. This is for me, personally speaking, one of the most powerful Rashis in the entire Torah that gives us a loud and clear message of how important is the topic of Ben Adam Lahavero between people. Which that being said, that brings me to the Zohar of yesterday. The Zohar Kadosh says that Borei Olam calls Bnei Israel Reshit, the beginning of the nations, Beni Bechori Israel, my firstborn, the Pasuk from last week's Torah portion, Be'atem Tihuli Mamlechet Kohanim Begoi Kadosh, you're going to be a nation of priests and a holy nation, etc. So there is an incense of Kedusha, of holiness, that every Jew has the potential to achieve and to develop. In other words, God's investments in the life of the person is there. The fact that a person is born to Am Israel and has a neshama, which is called Helek Elokam Iman, the neshama of a Jew is called like a piece of Hashem is inside of the person. So therefore, it says that for this reason, says the Torah, needed to give me guidelines of how to act. In other words, we have the Ten Commandments, honor the Shabbat, respect your parents, do not kill, do not steal, do not covet, do not give false testimony, don't do idolatry. Those are the foundations of the entire Torah, which all the misvot of the Torah, including the seven rabbinical laws, are hidden in the Ten Commandments. Remember, we learned this, I think, in the time of Hanukkah. The Ten Commandments contains 620 letters. And every letter of the Ten Commandments connects with one mitzvah of the Torah. The final seven letters of the Ten Commandments, if you look in the Humash, you'll see how does the Ten Commandments finishes. Asher lere'echa which belongs to your friend. The seven letters, Aleph, Shin, Resh, Lamet, Ein, Resh, Chav, represents the seven Noahide law, the Mechila, the seven rabbinical laws, I apologize for that, and the Chav, the last letter of the Lere'echa, it stands for the celebration of Hanukkah, which according to our records, this was the last Takana that the Hachamim uh, made, if I remember correctly. So the commandments are in the Ten Commandments. But now comes the BOC in the Zohar Kadosh and it says that the misvot that we discuss in Perasha Mishpatim, I like to say, and if you allow me a moment, Human interaction, human interaction, 
human interaction, human interaction, human interaction, heavenly, human, 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 human. Most of the misvot that we'll discuss in this week's Torah portion are related Ben Adam Lahavero. The BOC says in the Zohar that the misvot of Ben Adam Lahavero are there to increase shalom, to increase peace and harmony among humans. One of them is the very famous misvah of a person purchasing a Jewish slave, a Jewish slave that committed a financial crime and does not have the money to pay back. He will be sold as a slave and the master will retrain him and will help him to rehabilitate himself and not commit any more crimes. This is in a nutshell what the Mizvah of Eve Divri is. And if you look in the Perasha and the Mefarshim, you, it's telling you that the way you treat a Jewish slave is not different than the way you treat yourself. What you eat, he eats. This is a Gemara, clear. In other words, why the Torah gives us such a powerful concept of the Mizvah of Eve Divri? One answer is, that the Torah believes all heartily that the person can, and I repeat, can be rehabilitated. Obviously, it's not an overnight process, but it takes effort and it takes time, and the dedication and continuity and constancy, etc. Obviously, in the Torah concepts, we don't really see the concept of sending a person to jail. Maybe there is something called holding cell until the verdict comes across, but to say to the person, okay, you're gonna to go to jail, God forbid, for X amount of years for the crime committed, this is not a system that is actually supported by the Torah. Because the reality is that, unfortunately, a lot of negative influences the person can derive from being in jail. And sometimes people become worst offenders being in jail than before they went to jail. And obviously, this is not the purpose of today's class of talking about the jail system, but it's just only to reinforce what the Zohar Kadosh is, that the purpose of many of the misvot that we have is to bring respect and harmony between people. And once that exists, so we are in the proper track, because having only Ben Adam Lamakom behavior, meaning to say, my relationship with God is great, but my relationship with my spouse, has Shalom, or with friends is completely the opposite, which by the way, in this week's Torah portion, we also learn the responsibilities of the husband to the wife. She'era kesuta be'onata lo igra. The three biblical mandatory requirements plus the seven rabbinical requirements that a husband must do for his wife. From the Torah perspective, she'era means maintenance, food, health, whatever she needs. A kesuta, kesuta means from kesut, covering of the body, meaning to say garments, onata, her time, all-inclusive, communication, dialogue, going out a bit, private time, etc. This is from this week's Torah portion as well. And there are more misvot famous misvot, which are connected to our interpersonal uh, relationship. And the Zohar Kadosh says, because once the person learns the misvot from the Torah, and the person makes the effort of putting them into practice, not only that the zehut of learning Torah by itself is a great zehut, but now that you're able to learn and to fulfill, as we'll say in the daily prayers, that's a per the prayer from the Yotzer Beracha, to learn and to teach, Lishmor, to guard, and to perform all the words of the Torah with love, with happiness, with joy, the way we discuss, etc. And it says, that one of the requirements that the world needs to have, and this is brought down also in the Mishnah, in Pirkei Avot, ala din, ala emet, ala shalom. The concept of 
judicial system and judgment between people. And that's the reason why in this week's Torah portion, or we can start from last week's, remember Itro comes to Moshe Rabbeinu? And what does Moshe tell to Moshe Rabbeinu? Moshe Rabbeinu, you're going to burn out. You're going to try to settle and to solve every person's situation when you're going to have time for anything else. So Moshe Rabbeinu listened. And Moshe Rabbeinu appointed the Yanim, every 10, every 50, every 100, every 1,000, and anything that was above and beyond the normal way will come to Moshe Rabbeinu. So Moshe Rabbeinu delegated. And that's the reason why in this particular perashah, there are many misvot related to the judges and to the people that go to the judges. And the judges, in a way, Elokim nisav ba'adat kel. Elokim nitzav. God is standing ba'adat kel in the, in the congregation of the Almighty. Elokim also means the language of Hashem's name connected to judgment. So when we say Elokim refers to judges as well in this week's Torah uh, portion. And the Zohar Kadosh discusses different uh, uh, concepts and parameters that the Dayanim used to have. Today, I'm not sure that this is done since generations change and bodily needs are different and, and a person at times functions better with eating uh, prior uh, to a judgment instead of fasting but the Zohar says that ideally will be that the judges fast on that day that they are going to be judging or dealing with the rabbinical court days but the Maaseh just to clarify not so the Zohar Kadosh tells us that this is so powerful that whenever there is a judgment in this world there is no judgment in the heavenly world. That's, I believe, the language of the Gemara that says, Yesh din lemata en din lemala. When matters are able to be sorted out and to be saved and to be settled and to be decided, here the heavens don't need to get involved. Now, to our advantage, it's better to do things in this world. Why? Because in this world, we can settle. But in the heavenly court system, is guilty or innocent, black or white, no gray. But in the, in, the, in the judicial system of the planet Earth, there is such a thing of gray for the peace and harmony between uh, people. And therefore, uh, the Zohar Kadosh says that there is a difference between a judgment for financial matters, and when there is a judgment for life matters. What does it mean in life matters? Basically, it means when the crime committed, God forbid, is one of the few capital punishments that the Bedin needs to activate the ultimate level of judgment. This is called in Jewish law, Arba'a Midot Bedin, the four judicial type system type of execution, but not to frighten anyone, not to frighten anyone. We say this every Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. There was a time in history that the Bedin will activate the ultimate level of the law. But do not worry. The Gemara parallel to that says, if the Bedin will execute one person in 70 years, that means the Sanhedrin, it will be considered a murderer type of Sanhedrin. So what is the Gemara is trying to tell us? That this concept of execution, really it was not activated and put into practice for the judgment of people because they needed to have the consensus of the Sanhedrin and they needed to, to go above and beyond the normalcy to be able to find a way of how to spur this person's life, but give them a different type of consequence. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyways, with that being said, we're going to move on to the Musar. The Musar of yesterday. It says, Izaher ha'adam, 
The person should be careful. Miliot aser beneenach. Don't be depressed and don't kvetch. Don't complain. Uh, this Shabbat in Lakewood for Minha, we went to pray to the synagogue of Bardichov. You heard the Kedushat Levi. And when you come into the synagogue outside, there is a sign that says, please, we respectfully ask you to leave behind your bitterness, your sadness, or your drama. As we're getting ready for the month of Adar, and the month of Adar is full of joy and happiness for the entire Jewish world. Beautiful sign, interesting. Whoever was with me walking to the shul stopped to read it. We all laughed, and it's powerful, powerful statement. And this is how it is in that synagogue. All positive messages, all happiness, no drama, and not bickering, and not uli, oyoy, uli, etc., the way sometimes people are. And divine providence that this is the opening statement of the Musar. And it says, Ki because sadness and sighing, like, ah. you know, sometimes people are like, the end of the world is coming, kamiachol. Although for some people, the end of the world may be coming, but not for us. Mashiach is coming, that's for sure. Gormim It says that brings down the person spiritually. It says, Being sad, it's an enemy of the person that affects the learning of Torah. It affects the prayer of the person. It confuses the brain, the brain, Mehilam. And it brings also a, a, a high level of sensitivity, which is dangerous. What kind of sensitivity? The language of the Musar says, Mahloket bebeto, allo davar. Suddenly, there is arguments at home between husband and wife, apparently for no reason. But why is this happening? Simply because one person of the two is affected by sadness and therefore it changes the whole mind of the person and everything bothers the person etc but not only that it says the musar Ki gorem you know what is the biggest danger of sadness or depression that causes godliness to stay away from the person simha what a powerful message. The Musar says that one of the names of God's presence is Simha, happiness. What a powerful message. Be Adam Ze, but this person, Hemar, became now bitter. Belodai, but not only that, that bitterness and sadness suddenly becomes protected by a special force and that's not mean the force of holiness but the opposite because sadness loves company in the way in english they say misery loves company so we can say that in this case sadness loves company Lachen. and therefore the musar says Ata ben adam, human Shiamarta Befija, that you say with your own lips, Haaver Raame Aleja, say it in your lips, in your mouth, Hashem, help me to remove this cloud of darkness, God forbid, from my life. Betie Sameah Tamid, but always look to be happy, to be positive, to be complimenting, to be more proper and respectful with your fellow men and everything helps everything helps but yes and count your blessings be happy because god god willing will give or may give the person 
When a person is happy, that you will become a magnet to godliness. And when I mean godliness, doesn't mean only spirituality. It means overall. And he says it. Shechina, godliness, and he creates simcha, that's called joy. And happiness minimizes the person coming to sin. What does it mean? It seems from the Musar that the fact that a person feels down or is depressed or sad, etc., that may lead the person not to do what he's supposed to do and eventually to commit certain transgressions as well. And when you are going to be happy, you're going to feel Hashem's blessings. But guess what? You're going to see and to recognize that there is peace in your home. And this is something that the Musar of today, it's loud and clear of telling us, not only reinforcing the concept of an Adam, la Havero, but actually understanding that it's in our best interest and in our power to do the best that we can to work in this particular area. So by Zat Hashem, we say Tzitzkela Mitzvot to the Baghdadi family for graciously sponsoring today's class, Lailu Nishmat, the beloved uh, mother and their beloved, uh, his beloved wife, uh, Rahel Bat Lora uh, Aliyah Shalom and Haneshama Havan Aliyah in Gan Eden. For those who usually tune in to the 10.30 Spanish class, as I'm getting ready to travel soon, unfortunately we will not have today class in Espanol, but Be'ezat Hashem will resume next Tuesday, Proximo Martes, 10 y media, eh, Be'ezat Hashem, via itora.com. Have a great day, everybody. Shabbat Tov, Umevorach.